The following has been recorded at Cairn University. Any reproduction of this recording without the express permission of the university is prohibited. Loving kindness, merciful love, loyal love, sure love, relentless love, enduring love, extravagant love, affectionate satisfaction, love in action, dependable love, steady love, true, fundamental love, miracle love, generous love, deep love, wonderful love, great love, incredible love, marvelous love, gracious love, loyal in love, steadfast love, tons of love, loving instruction, loving deeds, covenant love, covenant of love, covenant faithfulness, covenant deeds of love, covenant friendship, covenant commitment, gracious covenant, loyal, loyalty, covenant loyalty, loyal faithfulness, great loyalty, unswerving loyalty, loyal mercy, loyal service, kindness, kindly, divine kindness, loyal kindness, godly kindness, merciful kindness, great kindness, everlasting kindness, mercy, mercy work, mercy feeling, miracle mercy, generous mercy, benevolence, compassion, Persistent faithfulness, faithful act, reliable solidarity, goodwill, ardent zeal, grace, graciousness, extravagantly generous, largesse, glory, honor, honoring, pity, clemency, rock, bedrock, God-fearing, piety, charity, strength, devout, active kindness, favor, immense favor, loyal friendship, good-heartedness, immense favor, working graciously, generous, yes, endlessly patient, generous act of kindness, devotion, devoted work, commitness, commitment, goodness, good deeds, gracious dealing. I've lost my place. Beauty, disgrace, reproach, shameful thing, wicked thing, sticking by, sticking with, big-heartedness, Unlimited, unconditional, unconditioned, and all-exclusive love for all creation. In eight different translations of the English uh, Old Testament, this one word is translated 169 different ways. I just read them all to you. All of those words were an attempt to translate one word. And that's what I want to talk about uh, this morning. I'm completely obsessed with this word. Um, I have a tattoo of it, but I won't show it to you because I don't. In fact, I got it when I was here. Well, not at, at Karen, but <laughs> right down the road. Uh, I'm not encouraging tattoos. Uh, in fact, if you tattoo this on yourself, you kind of don't get it. So I'm an example of not getting it. <laughs> Let me read you just a little introduction uh, to a book that I've just finished. I've worked on this for about 10 years. I just finished a book that I rewrote three times. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, it comes out in December, and it's on this, this word hesed. Hesed is how you're supposed to say it, but I feel silly spitting when I talk. Let me read you the, the little introduction, a part of the introduction to this book. The most profound mysteries are not found hidden away in remote secret places. They are mostly an unrecognized part of everyday life. I'll read that again. The most profound mysteries are not found hidden away in remote secret places. They are mostly an unrecognized part of everyday life. We fret over mowing the lawn and miss the deep mystery of how the grass grows. We seek to hush a weeping baby but rarely ask where tears come from or what they could possibly mean. Most mysterious of all are the sounds we make with our teeth and tongue, the symbols we scratch across a legal pad and peck out on a keyboard. They seem the most ordinary part of our world, words, but they are a mystery. At this moment, I'm writing them and you're reading them. The thoughts that my word elicit in your own brain are composed of words. In fact, you can't think without words. Uh, this book, this, this is the introduction to, is founded on this inexpressible mystery in general and upon ha perhaps the most mysterious and inexpressible single word of all, uh, the Hebrew word hesed, chesed. R remember our talk <coughs> from day four yesterday? Remember the map? I'll just refresh your memory. 
um, that the Bible's taking us someplace. Uh, this is Genesis, Revelation, um, Psalm, uh, it's a, uh, a Job, Job 1, Job 43 or something. I don't remember the number. Numbers have no meaning for me, absolutely none. Uh, Psalm 1 and Psalm 150. Okay, so this is, the, this is the journey the Bible's taking us on from Torah, Torah obedience, obedience, to intimacy with God, with an experience of His presence. Let's see, okay, in the middle part of this journey is what? Wilderness. Wilderness. Okay, these are the categories. Uh, and I told you that the, the Torah which is good and perfect because God gave it to us, uh, is I'm expressing it as an equation, which is a vast oversimplification. But if you're obedient, God will bless you. If you're disobedient, God will punish you. Okay. And what I want to talk about, and I'll let you see it, this is chesed. chesed. Um, um, in my way of thinking, I suggest to you that chesed is the last part of this equation. That's what I'd like, to, I'd like to look at. Okay. <clears throat> I already told you, 169 different uh, translations. Uh, the two major formulae uh, in, in Judaism uh, both have this word in it. Uh, the first one is that God is slow to anger and rich in hesed. Uh, the second formula, which is sort of Israel's in God we trust. I mean, Israel will say this phrase and their enemies will start killing each other. It's incredible. Okay. The second formula is that God is rich in, uh, that the Lord is good, tov, and his hesed endures forever. Those are the two uh, formulas, the formulae that uh, kind of tie the Old Testament together. Very important. Um, like a lot of words do as it goes through uh, the Hebrew Bible, there's, it shifts and it kind of moves around. Uh, words don't have one literal meaning. They, they derive their meaning from the context. So in Genesis, in general, and this is vast oversimplification, in Genesis, in general, chesed is a, a favor that's unexpected. Genesis 19.19 19 is the first time the word appears in the Bible, and a lot is asking the angels for a favor. Let me go to this city, because it's close by. Do me, do me a chesed, okay? He has no right to expect it, but he sort of hopes that the angel will do this for him. In, in Exodus, it, it only appears five or six times, uh, but in Exodus, it, 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 it's the word, and this is a passage we're going to look at. In Exodus 34, it's the word that God uses to define himself. So, kind of important. And we'll look at that passage. Uh, in the historical books, Hesed, by and large, uh, describes a relationship between, between two people, usually David and someone, somebody else. And it's this, this relationship that has a certain amount of expectation. If I show you Hesed, you're supposed to show me Hesed. That's kind of how it works. Um, Mephibosheth, right? Is there anyone left in Saul's household that I can show kindness to, grace to, mercy to? So in, in general, in, a, in, a, in the wisdom books, uh, it, it, it has to do with this relationship. Uh, in the Psalms, where it appears most often, it's sung. Hesed is something you sing about. In fact, when Asaph receives his, his marching orders, he says, this is what you're going to sing about. The Hesed of the Lord endures forever. That's your theme. And so in uh, most of Asaph's psalms, uh, that, that comes up. In the prophets, where the, the word doesn't happen as much, but it, that doesn't mean it's not as important, the prophets basically talk about how our hesed is pretty thin. It vanishes in the morning like dew. I think Hosea says that. Uh, but they talk about how strong God's hesed is. That's very important. Um, Okay, that's sort of a over, quick, vast oversimplification uh, overview of this, this word. I'm just trying to get you interested in it. Um, one, other, yeah, one other sidebar, one of the things that Hesed does, which is uh, unique, uh, it does more than any other word, is it draws other words to it, which is really cool. Yeah, I, I call this linguistic gravity. You know, the bigger a star is, the more gravitational pull it has, you know. Um, and hesed means so much that writers have to use other words to help you understand it. And there are basically seven other words that it draws to itself. So these are related to hesed, but they sort of help hi highlight it. They, they orbit around hesed. The, the, the word that happens most often is truth, emmet. 
uh, grace and truth, when God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 34, he says, I'm full of chesed va'emet, grace and truth. And then when John reveals who Jesus is in, first, in John uh, chapter 114, what does he say Jesus is full of grace and truth? Same thing, okay? Uh, uh, another one of the words is, is mercy, uh, covenant, justice, faithfulness, goodness, which is a much bigger word in Hebrew than it is in English. Uh, favor, righteousness, these are just words that it pulls to itself. Okay, so let's, let's look at the, the Exodus passage, and, and then I want to look at one passage in the New Testament where it comes in, and I'll shut up. Okay, <clears throat> Exodus 34. <coughs> Excuse me, well, I bet that hurt. Uh, Interesting to me is the, the, to compare the levels of intimacy between Exodus 19, the first time Moses gives up the mountain, he gets the tablets, and gets mad and throws them and busts them, and the second time he goes up in 34. To compare the levels of intimacy in those two stories, it's really, it's really powerful. Uh, and the first time when he comes down, his face isn't shining, but the second time it is. So something really unique happened that, that affected that, and I think what happened is God revealed himself as a God of Hesed. Um, but this is Exodus uh, 30, uh, 34, 5. The Lord came down in a cloud, stood with him there, and proclaimed his name. You know, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed. The Lord, the Lord, is compassionate and gracious. He's a compassionate and gracious God. When God defines himself, the first word out of his mouth isn't holy or powerful or all-knowing or all those things. The first word out of his mouth, Racham. He's compassionate. Okay? He's compassionate. What's the surprise of the New Testament? The surprise of the New Testament is that when Jesus comes, he's a slave. He dies like a slave. He washes their feet. That's the big... He, 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 he emptied himself and take, took on the form of a doulos, a slave, Paul says. The surprise of the, of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Bible, I think, is that God is kind. That's the big surprise. All powerful, I get that, right? That's what, you know, God is all powerful. And he's holy. I can't touch a mountain, the bottom of a mountain that he's on the top of. He's so holy. Okay, I get that. But that he's kind? Nobody saw that coming. In all the vast literature, of, you know, the hymns to other pagan gods, they never use the word kind. This was a, a new thing. So I'm, 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 uh, I, I'm, I'm compassionate and gracious Slow, here's the formula, slow to anger and abounding in hesed and truth. There's that, it draws this word hesed to it. Maintaining, and here's the word again, he uses it twice. Maintaining hesed to a thousand generations. In, in Hebrew it basically said, showing hesed to thousands. Thousands. Um, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. The whole range of things we can do wrong. Iniquity, rebellion, and sin. So that's, that's part one of his revelation that I want to focus on. We don't have time to look at it, but part two is just as important. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished. So yes, is he compassionate? Yes. Is he gracious? Yes. Does he show hesed to a thousand generations? Yes. Uh, and that's where a lot of people stop in their understanding of God. But you need to know the second part of, of his revelation, because of his holiness... He doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. Okay? Bringing the father's iniquity, and let me, let me translate this better. Bringing the consequences of the father's sin on the children and grandchildren of the third and fourth generation. The Bible's very clear. We, get, we don't get punished for other people's sin. The soul that sins is the soul that will die. Uh, but he visits the consequences of their father's sin because that's the nature of sin, and it's actually another part of his grace. In just a few uh, uh, verses... They will, they will refuse to enter the promised land. Okay? So they go back into, the, back into the wilderness for 40 years, and what happens? The two generations following experience the consequences of their father's sin, but they enter the promised land. My father was a workaholic. He was a doctor. He was gone all the time. I experienced the consequences of my father's sin, and that's a blessing from God. Right? It's a blessing from God that helps me see, you know, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be like that guy. Okay. But here's what I want you to see. Verse uh, 8. Moses immediately knelt low to the ground and worshipped. 
What's the first thing Job did, did when he found out uh, his children had died? He worshipped. What's the first thing David found out when he found out the little boy had died but that he and Bathsheba had had? He worshipped. What does uh, Moses do when God reveals himself to him? He worships. And this, by the way, all happens in the wilderness. They just got there. This happens in the wilderness. That's where worship happens, is in the wilderness. The word begins anyway. But what I want you to know, here, here's the biggie right there. Then he said, my Lord... If indeed I have found favor with you, my Lord, please go with us. Even though we're stiff-necked people. What God had said because of the previous sin, God said, yeah, I'm not going in the promised land with you. I'll send you know, the, kind of the angel of my presence with you. I'm not going in. I might destroy you along the way. You're a stiff-necked people. But I want you to see what Moses is doing. Moses is asking for what he knows he doesn't deserve. Why is he doing that? Because he's just revealed, God has just revealed himself as a God of hesed. What's my definition of hesed? It takes a sentence. My definition is when the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. Okay? So there's very, very brief. It comes into the New Testament. The, the, this word does uh, uh, in, in a couple of uh, interesting ways. Jesus actually says it twice. I'm so grateful for that. Twice in, in, uh, in, uh, in Matthew when the, the Pharisees are giving him a hard time, he shouts at him, he says, if, just go find out what this means. I desire hesed and not sacrifice. So I've got two places I can show you, Matthew, Matthew where Jesus usually actually says the word. He defines it, I think, in, I believe, in Luke 6, where he says, I think it's the most remarkable thing he ever said. Jesus says, God, he's talking about loving our enemies. Why should you love your enemies, right? Why should we love our enemies? Jesus says, because God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Why should I love my enemies? Because God loves his enemies. Who's God's enemy? Me. He's been kind. That's the surprise. He's been kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And that kindness is his hesed. Okay? It is his hesed. Okay, uh, one more, quickly, one more story. My favorite story in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the New Testament. So here goes. Uh, I'm not going to tell you where it is. Just listen. Think along with me. Don't write this down. Just think along with me. When he uh, concluded saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum, which is his hometown. He lives there in Peter's house, we think. A centurion's servant who was highly valued by him was sick and about to die. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his servant. When they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, he is worthy for you to do this. What is that? That is Judaism in a nutshell. You should do this because he deserves it. He's been obedient, so you should bless him. Got it? See, this all fits together. It all fits together. And this is Ju These are the elders from the synagogue. He, he donated a synagogue, and actually the foundations of that synagogue are still there. In Capernaum, I can show them to you. Um, Okay, he's worthy for you to, because he loves our nation and he's built us a synagogue. So Jesus went with him. And it was, when he was not far from the house, the Lord sent friends to tell him, Lord, don't, uh, to say, the centurion sent friends to tell him, Lord, don't trouble yourself since I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. That's why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. What did he just do? He acknowledged, I'm not worthy, but I want you to do it anyway. Do you get that? I'm not even worthy to have you come to my house. I'm a Gentile. You know why Jews won't go into Gentile homes? Because Gentiles uh, practice abortion, and uh, Jews look upon a Gentile home as a tomb. You don't go into the, the, the house of a Gentile. Jesus, uh, Peter goes into a Gentile home, and the first thing he says is, you know I'm not supposed to be here. I don't go to, I, we don't go into Gentile homes. So this, this Gentile centurion tells Jesus, I'm not worthy to even have you come to my house, so just say the word. See, that's what Moses did. When Moses realized that God was a God of Hesed, he asked for what he didn't deserve. This centurion uh, asked for what he doesn't deserve because he has somehow uniquely linked himself. Uh, he's a, he's a God-fearer. We'll meet a lot of them in Acts. He keeps the pillars of Judaism. He gives to the poor. He fasts and he prays, that sort of thing. But he understands God in a, in, in, in a unique way. He understands that he can ask for what he doesn't deserve. So you just say the word and my servant will be healed. 
And then he gives Jesus a little speech on authority, which I find interesting. This is a man who will fall on his sword if his commanding officer tells him to do so. So he knows about authority. I too am a man placed under an authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, you better believe he goes. I inserted that. And I say to this one, come, you better believe he comes. I say to my servant, do this, you better believe he does it. You don't say no to the commanding officer, you just do it. Even if he says, you, fall on your soul, sword. You pull your sword out and you fall on your sword. That's the Roman army. See, this guy says, I understand authority and you got it. So just say the word. Okay, sidebar. Luke is the gospel of amazement. He, he exhausts the language of amazement. There are five different words that can be translated amazement. Luke uses all five of them, and he usually puts the two of them together. They were astonished and amazed. That's Luke and language. To this point, everyone's been amazed. The shepherds, the wise men, Jesus' mom and dad, everyone's amazed. Everyone but Jesus. This is the first time, and I think the only time in Luke, where it says that Jesus is amazed. Okay? So when he said this, or when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Amazed. That's a great word. You know what it means? It's the feeling that you get when you're cast into a maze. You are amazed. So what, what amazes this, this uh, 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 what about this centurion amazes Jesus? He asks for what he acknowledges he doesn't deserve. And I think this is fundamental to Hesed. We could talk for months, we could talk for the rest of our lives about Hesed. But that's the one thing I wanted to leave you with this morning. Let me ask you a question. Do you want what you deserve? You don't want what you deserve, trust me. I want what I don't deserve. And, and could, it possibly, could, it, could it possibly still happen that I could amaze Jesus the way he did and come boldly and say, I don't deserve this, but I want you to give it to me anyway. And Jesus would go, wow, Tony, I didn't see that coming. You know, Angela, you're starting to get it. You're starting to understand that the nature of my father is that he is, he is uh, he's a God of loving kindness. He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. That's the God, uh, that's the father of Jesus um, in the scriptures.